This is the Verbatim Word Podcast, where we seek biblical truth in a daily context. I'm Justin Geary. It seems like language is constantly changing, and it can be hard sometimes to keep up with. When I was a kid, our elders got confused when we called good things bad, and the hottest trends we called cool. The language evolution continues, even though I work in the schools it can be hard to keep up with. For example, some of the newest terminology apparently, no cap is a phrase that means no lie or I'm not lying or it's true. Like, did you just see that celebrity in the restaurant? You'd respond, I did, no cap. The opposite works too, I guess. If you say no cap in it means I'm not lying. Another term is the term drip. Well, don't call the plumber. I guess it basically means someone who has style or a good fashion sense. You could say, I like his drip, or he's got a nice drip, if you like his duds. One more is Riz. If you are a 10 on the Riz scale, then you get a lot of attention from the guys or the gals. We may have once said that someone has game, but now it is Riz. Riz is a short form of charisma. Some phrases or terms may even have been around for a long time, but are more obscure and then suddenly go a bit more mainstream. A term I have heard a lot more recently that I had to get someone to clue me in on was gaslighting. Gaslighting is kind of what we used to maybe call mind games. Medical News Today says it's a form of psychological abuse when a person or a group causes someone to question their own sanity, their own memories, or their perception of reality. They turn something back on you that may not have been your fault, for example. There was a 1938 play turned into a film in the 40s called Gaslight. The story is of a husband who manipulates his wife and makes her think that she has a mental illness. So when someone is gaslighting, they shift the blame back on you and make you feel like you are the problem when they had the actual problem. So even though it's a word that's been around for a long time, I just came across it more recently. Before gaslighting was a thing though, there was a term called scapegoat, language always changing, where someone is blamed or punished for the mistakes or actions of others. The scapegoat takes the blame or gets the blame or takes the fall, even though someone else may actually have been at fault. The term scapegoat is a biblical one and comes from early in the scriptures. In the Old Testament book of Leviticus, instructions were given for the priests for the Day of Atonement, the day of the year when the sins of the nation would be covered over. On Yom Kippur, the Hebrews would take two goats. One would be sacrificed and the other would be led out into the wilderness carrying the sins of the nation. The scapegoat was the goat who escaped. Carrying with it the blame, basically sent off and shunned, the priest would place its hand upon its head and confess all the sins of the nation and then send it packing out of town. And Israel would be cleansed for another year until the ceremony came around once more. Of course, the Old Testament is full of imagery of Jesus and who ultimately took the blame for us, but Jesus himself on the cross, something we are getting close to as we work our way through the Gospel of Mark on this podcast. But in this passage we look at today, we see some blame shifting going back and forth, a lot of scapegoating, as the religious leaders gaslight Jesus before Pilate, saying he has the problem, not them. And we also see a guilty prisoner set free while Jesus takes the fall. And ultimately, Jesus heads to the cross, taking the blame for our sin while we are let go, the ultimate scapegoat. It's all a bit surprising to watch go down as there are many wrongs and none of them make a right necessarily, but it is all a critical part of the gospel being fulfilled. So we pick up in Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. The drama continues in Mark 15, verse 1. Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes in the whole council, and they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. We get that term again, the term immediately, one that Mark uses often, as he ushers us quickly through the actions of Jesus' life and ministry, not always giving a ton of details, but sticking to the main point to get all the important stuff in there. Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes in the whole council, and they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. So the trial overnight that we looked at in part on the last podcast, it was illegal. They broke so many rules by their own religious laws and guidelines, and now they're trying to cover their tracks a bit. Since one key thing was that the trials could not occur at night, now it is dawn. So they have a quick, quote, consultation, which is not a trial. They're all in agreement already, and at this point, there is no really going back. But the thing, the way that things were, the Jews could not do anything to get rid of Jesus on their own. Rome had stripped them of this right to capital punishment. So they had to get the Romans involved at this point, and Pilate was their man. The Jewish leaders are looking for a scapegoat, someone to do their dirty, dirty work. They want to get rid of Jesus. 
They found him guilty of blasphemy, claiming to be God, but the Romans would care less about this charge because the Romans had many gods. So it was just one more, and why should they care? But they are playing the political card with Pilate and change the charge when they get to him. But using Pilate and the Roman laws as a scapegoat for their own wrong reasons for wanting to oust Jesus, so immediately in the morning, they get to work. Roman hearings took place early in the morning, so they are all up and ready to march him straight to Pilate. This moves us into the second phase of Jesus' trial, the one before the Romans, an odd dynamic between the Jews and the Romans that we will explore in a second. This shifting of blame, it's a tale as old as time. Go back to the Garden of Eden, shortly after the fall, when Adam is called to account. Out of his mouth he says, well, it was the woman you gave me, shifting the blame, not taking responsibility for his own choices, his own actions, and his own sin. That Adam nature is still within each of us, and we are quick to shift the blame, aren't we? It was the woman you gave me is just the start. It was their fault. If they only knew how to drive. I didn't know. They never told me. Or, of course, the ever-increasing victim approach that everyone else did something in the past, or society even, that has left us in our present circumstances. As a teacher, I'm always amused at this one. The teacher didn't know how to teach, and that's why I did poorly. It's Adam's nature within us that looks for someone else to blame, a scapegoat to take the fall. King David messed up royally, no pun intended, having taken Bathsheba as his own and essentially coming up with a plot to have her husband killed to cover up his indiscretion. And some time later, when the prophet Daniel is called in to confront David, Nathan first presents the situation in a generic way that David does not know that Nathan is talking about him. Nathan presenting the issue in an almost parable form about one man taking another man's sheep. The first man having all the sheep that he wanted, greedily taking the one sheep that the simpler man had. And David is mad. Who would be so cruel to take that one man's sheep when this is all that he had, especially when the transgressor had all that he wanted and much more? Well, when David begins to fume and demands to know who this man is who did such a cruel thing, Nathan cuts to the chase. David. You are the man. And David, though not perfect, was a man after God's heart, and in that moment is convicted, and he does not seek anyone else to blame. Well, if only so-and-so would have done this, or if only being a king was not so tough at times, or if only God had not made me this way and given me such desires, or if only Bathsheba had not been so nice or attractive, or if only her husband had not been so righteous and honorable, a really goody two-shoes, no. David's response, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. David owned up to it. Later, when David would write Psalm 51 in, in reflection of this incident, he says, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you. You only Lord have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. We looked at that psalm on a recent podcast too, but David begins by saying, For I acknowledge my transgressions. I own up to them. And then he goes on, Against you, you only have I sinned. David said, I did it. I am to blame. Lord, you know it was me. Being godly doesn't mean that we will never sin, but when we do, we take responsibility and we own it. Being honest with ourselves, those that we have hurt, and the Lord above all. That is where God's mercy flows, in true, honest repentance. Here, just hours before the cross, these religious leaders are setting up the scene for someone else to take the buck, passing off things to the Romans, making them their scapegoat. We're told in verse 1, And they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. They bound Jesus, tied him up. Tethers his, tethered his hands likely so he can't pull a fast one on them, tied a rope to him probably so he can't make a run for it. They want to make sure that they are in control of Jesus, and he is at their command. They have him bound. How ironic. Jesus cannot be bound. Even the night prior, with the mob descending upon him to arrest him in the garden, Jesus had said, Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How foolish to think that keeping Jesus bound could stop him. Jesus has complete and total freedom to do anything he wants. He is God. He is Lord. 
He is king. No one binds Jesus. We think we can, though, and we are wrong. Society tries to bind Jesus, remove him from our society, declare his name off limits. It's something they tried to do after Jesus was resurrected and ascended, when Jesus continues his work through his disciples. Peter and John used by Jesus to heal a paralyzed man at the temple, who left jumping and leaping and praising God. And in the conflict that ensued, they were brought in and reprimanded by the religious leaders. Acts 4, beginning in verse 18. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. This attempt to bind Jesus in society, to keep him out, and things that did not stop with the early church. Today, they tell his followers they can't use his name, share his word, pray to him, talk to others about him. They try to separate his church from having any influence in society. It's an attempt to bind Jesus. But Jesus will not be bound. It's amazing how Jesus' church has flourished in places where it has been prohibited or sought to be controlled. Places like China have a thriving underground church, some of the strongest believers there. Jesus is not bound, nor will he be bound. Jesus told his own disciple Peter in the Gospel of Matthew, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell can't keep Jesus' church out, can't keep Jesus out. Jesus is not bound or limited. He can take ground even when effort is made to keep him out. What's more, we personally sometimes try to bind Jesus, but is that the way it should go? Saying no when he seeks to lead us? Declaring parts of our lives off limits to him, to his work, to his authority, to his insight? It's like some of us want Jesus near, maybe in a chair in the corner, but like in the movies, we will sit him on the chair and gag him and tie his hands behind his back, hoping he will just sit there and comply, warning him not to make a move or else, and when we need him, we'll unbind his mouth for a little bit to say something or untie his hands if we need help with something. Our efforts to bind Jesus in our lives, how do these fare? I think often he will sit and comply for a while. Let us go about our business and then let things get to a point where we mess it all up and come to our senses and go untie him and unbind him and ask for his help to come and clean up the messes that we made while we relegated him off to the side and said that we would take care of things ourselves. Just sit right there, Jesus, bound in the corner, all right? For others, they bind Jesus from their lives and in his love, he lets them go. Like the prodigal son who asked for his inheritance in advance and the father let him go. The son essentially bound the father up, wanted to limit his influence, keep him at bay and put some distance between his influence and the son's jurisdiction. And the son, when he got to where he was headed, he was miserable. He wanted to come home. And the father was bound by an invisible border that the son had set, a line in the sand that the son had drawn, saying, don't cross this. I will do my own thing here and you stay over there. But the son finally came home. And the father was no longer bound, but came running, arms stretched out to receive his son home again. Binding Jesus from our own lives will only leave us longing for what he so freely offered us in the beginning. In Mark 15 verse 1, this group of religious leaders think that they can bind Jesus, but Jesus is free to do what he pleases. He is the Lord. Man tries to bind Jesus, his name, his work even. But even today, with the Holy Spirit, Jesus cannot be bound. How wonderful to hear stories of Jesus reaching into hearts that have pushed him far away, touching hearts deep within, breaking them, speaking to them, healing them, moving them. How amazing to hear testimonies of Jesus reaching across borders where he is prohibited, stories of individuals and people groups where Jesus is unknown, having supernatural dreams even of Jesus beckoning them to come to him. The work of Jesus cannot be bound. And it is always amazing to see it spread despite man's attempts to limit it. We've had some warm, dry, windy days as of late this spring, and fire is a big danger after a dry winter. And we had really windy conditions a week or so ago, power outages from down power lines and wildfires that sparked because of them. In one afternoon, the Oklahoma City Fire Department responded to 350 fire-related calls, all in one day, one afternoon, because fires kept jumping and spreading. It was almost out of control and could have been really bad. Thankfully for us, not as bad as some others where people did not fare so well. Think of the California wildfires of recent years, devastating whole regions. 
the fire spreading out of control. Oh, mankind may have thought throughout history that Jesus could be bound, but he was not, nor will he be at this time in history as well. He can spread, his gospel can spread, his messages can spread, his work can spread like wildfire. Paul wrote to the Colossian church, speaking in their day about Jesus' gospel, which has come to you, he wrote, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth. Jesus and the work of the gospel may seem at times that they are being bound and limited, but Paul assured the Colossians and us that it goes forth into all the world and it brings forth fruit. The work of Jesus cannot be bound. This should encourage us in our faith, to pray in faith, that Jesus can go behind any wall, across any border, into any heart, into any mind, into any relationship or marriage or prison or school or office or den of iniquity. Jesus is never bound. But to fulfill the Father's ultimate plan, Jesus complies and goes bound before them to Pilate, where we read beginning in verse 2. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said to him, It is as you say. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you? But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. So they bring Jesus to Pilate, the Roman official over that region, and they tell Pilate that this Jesus said he is the king of the Jews, which under Roman rule, there was only one king, Caesar, and any other king would be viewed as a threat and not allowed, an act of rebellion and treason, more or less. Now, the Jews knew Pilate to be a cruel man, so they assumed that he'd do their dirty work, jump on the fact that this Galilean claimed to be king, and squash him of the rebellion. But Pilate may have been a bit suspicious. He saw the Jews as usually contrary and a contentious people. So he's probably wondering why they're, quote, doing him a favor, offering up this guy. Why are they wanting to turn him in and, and help Pilate in Rome? But the issue has been made. So Pilate has to do something. He asked Jesus straight up, are you the king of the Jews? Roman law would allow the accused to state their side and then hear witnesses too. So this is Jesus' chance by law to give his side. Now, the issue here is, yes, Jesus is the king of the Jews, but not the way in which all thought or anticipated, or certainly not in a way that Pilate would have needed to felt threatened or concerned as far as Rome would need to be. No insurrection planned, no coup being organized, no assassination attempts. Have you ever been asked a question, but if you answer simply yes or no, they don't get the full story? It's like being presented as a multiple choice question on a test, but you wish it were an essay question. Because with an essay question, you could talk your way through it, prove your point, give evidence for your reasoning, rather than being narrowed down to a specific answer and judge based on that. When you feel the answer that you want to give might need a bit more explanation. At the online school that I work at part-time, students complete and turn in their work from home. So we are not in the classroom together. They can't walk up to my desk with questions. And many of the quizzes and tests have multiple choice questions. And I'll sometimes get students emailing it after a test explaining why they chose an answer and their reasoning why they think it should be marked right. It might be something they saw in the curriculum or another reason that they can give that they want to defend their answer choice, even though the automated test key selected something else. Well, while the computer test key will not listen and reason with them, I can. And many times I feel the student had justified their answer and I might even give them credit for the answer choice that they selected. In this situation with Pilate, a yes answer, well, it would need to be qualified. So yes, technically Jesus is the king of the Jews, but not as everyone thought. So he gives a yes, then Pilate has all the evidence he might need to condemn Jesus. Instead, Jesus answered and said to him, it is as you say. It's an affirmative answer, but a yes with some reservations or some qualifications. Pilate does not have the full story. So it means Pilate will have to do a bit more digging to get to the root of the issue before making a decision because Jesus did not just come out and say, yes, I'm guilty as charged. So the religious leaders jump in to fill in what they think Pilate needs to know. It says, and the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you? But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. The chief priests accused him of many things. 
something we see in Luke 23, verse 2, where we read, And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So they paint this political picture of Jesus, the harm that he intended to bring upon Rome in their own view of things. And they trump up the charges, something we see in Luke 23, verses 4 and 5. It says, But they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. Three times we get there the intel that Jesus said nothing. And Pilate marvels. This man was used to, no doubt, to people groveling, pleading for their innocence, knowing that their faith rested in Pilate's hands, so they would take any and every opportunity to be heard. But Jesus remained silent, even with multiple opportunities to say something. He could have jumped in at any time and defended his innocence, but he does not. And Pilate marvels. God's people are often called upon to let the Lord be their defense, to wait and to trust that the Lord will come through for them. Where either through circumstances or through command, the Lord makes you take your hands off the situation, to not take up arms to defend yourself, to not position yourself in any way to win the fight, but to step back and to let him get in between you and whatever's looming. Moses and the nation of Israel was at a loss, did not know what to do. They had departed Egypt on the night of the Passover. After applying the blood on their doorposts, the angel of death passing over their homes by the show of faith that while the tenth plague of the firstborn passed through their land. And then defeated, Pharaoh let Moses and the people go. They had begun their journey in triumph, but soon the tide turned. And they found themselves stuck, the Red Sea on one side and the pursuing Egyptian army on the other. Trapped, they were desperate. The people began to panic, wondering if they should have ever left Egypt or if they would have been better off if they just remained in slaves there. Then Moses tells them, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. God is going to defend this people against the Egyptian army that is hot on their tail. He will do the fighting. Their job, to hold their peace, to remain at peace. In fact, that night the angel of the Lord wedges himself between the Egyptian army and the fearful Israelites as a cloud and a pillar of fighting, creating a defense barrier to hold the Egyptians at bay, allowing Moses the night to stand with his rod stretched over the sea as it parted, and time for the Israelites to regroup and place their eyes upon the Lord and eventually walk through the seas that have parted. In an on-demand world that nudges us to put up a good fight at every turn and to defend yourself relentlessly and look out for yourself. And Cobra Kai has taught us to strike first, strike hard, no mercy. It can be a big test of faith when God calls us to lay down our weapons and to let him defend us, leaving it in his hands, letting it go to God. Who will stand up for us, we wonder? Well, the Lord will. It's an act of faith to really let go and to let God. Some of us may have often found ourselves in positions of needing to defend ourselves, and we might be quick to put up our dukes, but the Lord has us fight our battles in other ways, and that begins with letting the Lord be our defense. Jesus does that very thing in this section, not speaking, holding his peace even with the opportunity to defend himself. And Pilate marvels because this was not the norm. This scene would normally be filled with those begging for mercy, doing anything they could to win favor, mercy, a pardon perhaps. But Jesus knows the Heavenly Father has ultimate jurisdiction in these proceedings, and Pilate takes note, and he marvels. Pilate finds no wrongdoing in Jesus, no basis for these charges. He says it over and over again according to the other Gospels. Luke 23, 4 and verse 14, John 18, verse 38, John 19, verses 4 through 6, I find no fault in this man. But Pilate is politically motivated, and if he lets Jesus go, it could start an uprising, and that will fall on his watch, and the Romans will not be pleased if that happens. So Pilate has an idea that he thinks just might work. Mark 15, verses 6 through 11. It says, Now at the feast he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. 
but the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that they should rather release Barabbas to them. There was a tradition here at the holiday to give early release to a prisoner, to show mercy and let someone go at their request. So Pilate presents this opportunity, names a clear known rebel, violent man, a murderer, and Jesus who is not guilty of anything. And Pilate is hoping that the crowd will choose Jesus to be released and Pilate will then be off the hook of having to make this tough decision. Imagine this, with one quick poll of the crowd, one audience participation vote, Jesus could have been set free based upon this tradition at the feast. It was man's way of showing mercy, a popularity vote on who to set free. But man's ways of doing things and God's ways of doing things are many times not the same. God will and can be a harder his, God's will can be a harder route sometimes, but it is more blessed in the end. It can be more challenging, require more dedication, even loss or pain to pursue God's will. But in the end, God does much more. Man's tradition could have set Jesus free then and there, a show of mercy by the crowd, but then the cross would not have happened for Jesus, and our salvation not obtained. God's will for our lives does not always involve the smooth or easy path. While man, while man might offer us that option, God may have a tougher road, but the fruit of all that is accomplished does not compare. I read this story recently in a book used as an illustration. A 12-year-old girl in New York had signed up for a 5K running event. Her mom, dropping her off at the starting line, went to find parking, then headed to the finish line to cheer her daughter on when she finished in what she anticipated would be an hour later. When the 12-year-old girl got to the starting line, she realized the race had just started, so she filed in at the back of the pack. She ran and did her best to keep up, and it kept going and going. At about mile four, the girl started asking other runners how much longer until the finish line. That's when the realization came. This was not the 5K event. The girl had joined in the half marathon that had been scheduled to start just before the shorter event that she had signed up for. Instead of a 5K, she was now running a race more than 13 miles. The mom's girl at the finish line realized something was wrong when her daughter never showed up. And with the help of event organizers and police, they figured out what had happened and located the girl on the half marathon course. But when they caught up to this 12-year-old girl, she refused to quit. She kept going, and she finally crossed the finish line, having run about 10 miles more than she had planned. Her mom met her at the finish line, so happy but crying. She told a news station, I see her with her medal, and I thought, oh my gosh, she ran the other one, like for real. She decided to just keep running and not give up. It's kind of a modern day, a reality version of Forrest Gump. Just keep going. God may have laid out a harder path for you, where manna might have offered you an easier one. But you chose to maintain integrity rather than cheating. You skipped the offer in order to be obedient to what God has for you. You decided not to cut corners or cheat because it was not right. You stuck with the marriage. You remained faithful. You sought help. You fled the temptation. You waited for God's time. You said no when you could have gotten away with things. You just kept running, even though it was a longer and harder race. Man may have traditions that may present an easier option but God's ways are always more blessed. Jesus could have gotten through this with a simple audience vote, been sent home that day if the winds of, of opinion in the crowd had been favorable, but he had already prayed in the garden the night before. If there is any other way, let this cup pass for me. And the father's answer, there is no other way. The cross is the only way that man can be saved. And Jesus endured for that very reason. The writer of Hebrews said that though it was hard, he counted it joy, writing this, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That joy is knowing that his cross would pay for our sin and set us free. Pilate offers the crowd a man named Barabbas. His name means son of the father. Ironic, since Jesus is the Son of the Father. But what a contrast between these two men who bear a similar identity, at least in title. Barabbas' actions are listed here. He was a part of a rebellion, and he murdered in that situation. Barabbas is chained and bound with his fellow rebels, part of a bad gang all caught. Public knowledge that he did it. He's guilty. No reason to let him off. Pilate sees through it. He suggests the crowd let off Jesus in this arrangement since Pilate knows the religious leaders have turned Jesus over because of their own envy. No real charge to punish him for. But verse 11 gives us some insight. 
But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. The religious leaders stirred up the crowd. Oh, how the masses can be moved, being told what to believe and fed any and every lie to get them to comply. Sometimes it takes the form of propaganda. We've seen this in history. The masses duped to believe something and behave in certain ways based on some group's agenda. The Nazis come to mind. Some also wondering if that may have come into play during COVID, getting the masses to respond and react that in hindsight may not have been necessary after all. Sometimes the crowd can be stirred up in marketing campaigns. Everyone thinks that they need something. Pocketbooks and public opinions can be swayed. Sometimes stirring up the crowd, it comes in the form of peer contagion, where groups, often teens, are swayed to do things based on what others are doing. You might see a wave of things happening in a social group or a school or a community, and suddenly everyone's doing it. The National Institute of Health says peer contagion can impact areas like aggression, bullying, weapon carrying, disordered eating, drug use, and depression. Others look at the whole transgender influx as part of this concept of peer contagion, where the environment has become increasingly favorable to advocate for teens who head in that direction, suggesting that the increased suggestion that you can choose gender identity could be influencing people to do so. It's peer contagion. I saw a clip of in a documentary exploring this issue, and they asked a bush tribe in Africa that is quite removed about men choosing to be women and women choosing to be men. And this group there, this bush tribe, they're flabbergasted. They're not even sure how to respond. They don't even really get the question. They don't grasp the concept. To them in their culture, it is clear what is a man and what is a woman. But perhaps our Western world, with all its outlets and all its voices, and especially with social media, has stirred up the crowd. And we see this as well in verse 11. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. With those voices in the background, a reasonable person there that day would have chosen Jesus to be released. But this crowd was stirred up, choosing something that they may not have had if the stirring of the pot had not been there. How easily we can be swayed. Jeremiah said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We need to pray for discernment, especially as the world heads in its current trajectory, that we would have wisdom to know what is true and right, and not be stirred up by what is being suggested to us by a multitude of voices. So Pilate digs a bit deeper with his decision that they're pushing for, verses 12 through 15. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus, after he had scourged him, to be crucified. This is your king, isn't he? Pilate asks. What would you have me do? Crucify him, crying out all the more, Crucify him. Is this crowd fickle? A few days earlier, wasn't there a crowd crying out, Hosanna, save now, laying down their clothes and palm branches, a red carpet moment, the first time Jesus allowed himself to be openly acknowledged as the Messiah? Why the change in tune? Were they just fair-weather fans and in this period of a few days turned on him? Well, one thought is that this is early morning, and though Jerusalem was inundated with visitors from the Passover, most of the outer towners stayed out in the surrounding areas, setting up camp. They would venture into Jerusalem during the day, but overnight head back out. So this early, the Jewish town, the Jews in town would predominantly be from Jerusalem. The out-of-town Jews from the villages where Jesus was popular and had amassed a following, they would still be out in the countryside, just visitors there this week for the Passover. The Galilean Jews would have been sympathizers and would maybe not be represented in this crowd. So this group is predominantly made up of Jews from Jerusalem, and they may have already been adverse to Jesus with the political dynamic, and certainly easily swayed and stirred up by the religious leaders who held such sway in Jerusalem. Pilate finds no wrong in Jesus, but because of the crowd, he gives in. Now, again, Mark gives us some highlights. After coming to Pilate, when he hears Jesus is as, as a Galilean, he sends him to Herod. He has jurisdiction over Galilee, and Herod is eager to hear Jesus wanting for a long time an audience with him. But then he sends him back to Pilate, and the two become friends over this. But the ball is in Pilate's court, and because of the crowd, he acquiesces. Now, some of those things are skipped over by Mark because he's just giving us the highlights. But now we're back to this point. We are always to seek to please the Lord, 
not ourselves, not others, and especially not the crowd. Paul writing in 2 Corinthians, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. That is our aim, above pleasing ourselves or pleasing others, to please him. That is not on Pilate's radar, and Barnabas is released. What an injustice, a known rebeller, a known murderer, out free. People do long to see justice, even in our modern court system. If someone gets away with a crime due to a slick defense team or a technicality in the legal system, people are outraged, especially the loved ones of whoever the victim may have been. When there is no justice, people get mad. They take to the streets, they riot, they make a fuss, they burn things. There is no justice here in Barabbas getting released. Jesus is the scapegoat, and Barabbas basically gets a free pass. No remorse, no repentance, no recompense for the wrongs that he has done. Barabbas' name means son of the father, and Jesus is the true son of the father. He takes the fall. When God forgives us, it's not like he just turns a blind eye and says, well, I guess you get a pass. That would not be justice. Someone has to pay. And with us, justice is served when one pays for the wrongdoing, even if it is by proxy. Jesus paid for our sins. He takes the punishment that Barabbas should have had, and Jesus took the punishment that we deserve as well. We get off like Barabbas while guilty, but God does not just close his eyes and ignore our sin, but justice has been served. The sin is paid for and dealt with. Jesus has done it. It's the substitutionary sacrifice, Jesus taking our place, the scapegoat for our sins. That tradition prescribed to the priests way back in Leviticus to put the sins of the nation on the head of the goat and send it off for good, to disappear in the wilderness, never to come back, an escort taking it out and making sure it literally gets lost out there. Can you imagine if that goat wandered back, came back into town a few weeks later? The symbolism would be shot. The sin came back to haunt us. The Lord pays for our sin and then sends it packing not to come back to remind us. Jeremiah spoke of the new covenant that would come, which was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. And he wrote in chapter 31 of, of Jeremiah, For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. That was a huge thing for the Jews, because while the goat from last year might have taken the sin out in the wilderness a year later, a new goat would need to be recruited. All the sins of the most recent year piling up, another scapegoat was needed. I wonder if the goats ever found one another. This herd of scapegoats out in the wilderness, all the evidence of year upon year of sin, maybe even reproducing out there, a whole herd of scapegoats and their little scapegoat offspring. Imagine if they had made their way back to town, all that, quote, forgotten sin creeping back. The writer of Hebrews quotes from Jeremiah twice, making the point, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Let that be an encouragement for the believer in Jesus. If Jesus is the one that you've delegated to take your place in regard to your debt of sin, the Father says your sins and your lawless deeds, he will remember no more. What a sad, sad scene as Jesus becomes the scapegoat and is delivered to be crucified, given over to the Romans since the Jews had had their right to carry out capital punishment stripped from them. They had to come with charges that would get the Romans to do it, and they succeeded, as Jesus is led off to be crucified. But in those chaotic moments, as the crowd makes their demands and Pilate decides to give in to avoid any civil unrest if he stands up to their request, Pilate asks something ever so important. Verse 12, Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the King of the Jews? Pilate's question essentially, What do we do with Jesus? That is the most important question any of us can ask ourselves in life. What do we do with Jesus? Do we embrace him as a savior, stop trying to work our way to God, instead confessing that we are sinners and accepting his grace, by faith being saved through what he did? Is that what we do with Jesus? For those who do, forgiveness awaits. Jesus will be the scapegoat who takes our sins away. What do we do with Jesus? Some may keep him at a distance, arm's length, use him as a crutch when they need him, tie him back up on the chair in the corner when it's not desirable to give him too much pull in the relationship. Doing that with Jesus robs us of the fullness for which he came, 
to save us, but also to give us the fullness of life. But we, when we desire to do that with Jesus, we can't just call him Savior and friend. We must be willing to call him Lord as well. What do we do with Jesus? Do we reject him, turn our back on him, ignore him, even hate him, because he exposes where we have fallen short and we love our sin and to do things our way more than we love the opportunity to come clean and start anew? If we do that with Jesus, we have pursued temporary pleasures and treasures. And even though there might be some short-term satisfaction in those things, we have rejected him ultimately. And we ourselves stand responsible for our sin. It's ours to bear. And on the day that we stand before him, he, we will stand still covered in our own sin. And like the goat, we will be separated, sent out of his midst, told to get lost with no hope to return, no reunion, no coming back into the fold, cast out as a bearer of sin, because we bear our own sin. So that's the question of all questions, isn't it? What do we do with Jesus? Ask yourself that. Ask those around you as well. It's the most important question you will even have ever answered indeed. So Lord, we are in all of the humility with which you endured this scene that we looked at, the creator with all power and authority, going along with all that man's wicked intent plotted and planned the humiliation, the shame, and ultimately the suffering and the sacrifice. Lord, we thank you for enduring it all to give us at least the opportunity to be saved, to be forgiven, to have our sins taken away. For those of us who have done that, that in Jesus, Lord, we rejoice in so sweet of a salvation. We declare that it is not with works of righteousness that we have done, but with the precious blood of Jesus that we stand blameless and holy before you. For those who have not answered the question of what to do with you or answered it incorrectly, Lord, reveal yourself to them and use us to guide them if you see fit. But Jesus, we know that you know no bounds. May your word endure, may your work prevail, and may your victory be one that we celebrate and worship you long for after the crowds of this lifetime have been silenced before you. When one day, Lord, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you, Jesus Christ, that you are Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.